All right, welcome to Math 331 problem solving. Today we are going to do the egg drop problem. And thank you, and that was beautifully timed. I'm hoping that those were keys though, I'm not. Okay, excellent. If you were carrying eggs with you, I was gonna be exceptionally amazed. All right, how many of you have ever heard of the egg drop problem? You, okay, can you describe the egg drop problem? Um, you have a ladder that's I think it's a hundred that has a hundred drums. Okay. And you have two eggs. Okay. And each and Good. Both oh. the eggs are identical. Yes. So before I go any further, do you know how to solve the problem? Yes. Okay, so you are now you've just lost your voice. You'll become a soon. Okay? Good, you know how to develop <laughs> say okay, excellent. Okay, so no one else has seen the problem. Alright, so the original version, I actually heard it with a building, not with a ladder, but it's, it's the same thing. So you have a building with 100 floors, 199 all the way down to one. And you have two eggs. And then these are very special eggs. So when you drop these eggs, there's a certain critical floor at which they will crack. If you drop them below that floor, there is no damage to the egg, and you can drop them indefinitely. So let's say the lowest floor the egg cracks on is 15. You could drop it a billion times from any floor from 1 to 14, and there'd be no damage to the egg. But you drop it from 15 or higher, and it immediately shatters. Okay? It's possible that the egg could actually be dropped from the 100th floor and not fracture. Some versions say there is a floor in which it breaks. Other versions say that indefinite. So the question is, if you have two eggs, how do you most efficiently find the highest floor you can drop the egg from safely? At the end of the day, what do you need to have? I'm sorry? No. Just at least one? No. You need to know what floor you can drop eggs. So if you want... Think of these as the eggs that you are going to use before your kids come. And then you want your kids to be able to drop their eggs indefinitely. So you need to know what's the highest floor your kids can go to. Your two eggs do not need to be around when you are done oh, dropping. Okay. So we don't know which floor. So we don't know which floor. And we don't care if the two eggs survive. And we want to do this in some sense, the minimum number of drops. Now the question is, how should we measure success? How many tries? So we need to come up with a strategy, right? Now, before we come up with a strategy, the question is, I'm trying to think the, the best way to phrase this. It's very important to decide what metric you're using. How many of you have seen sorting algorithms from computer science? All right, give me a couple. Merge sort. Bubbles. Bubbles. <laughs> What's the random one? I think that's called the Bogle sort. Yeah, Bogle. Bogle? You yeah. just randomize. <laughs> you don't actually sort anything. You just randomly. Uh, quick sort. Quick sort. What's the one where you take, you do comparisons and march down the line and you move the largest oh, number to the end? Selection. Selection sort. Yeah. Insertion. Insertion. Okay. I, I think at this point we have, yes? I thought he lost his voice. <laughs> <laughs> so he's lost his voice mathematically. This is computer science. So he actually still has his computer science voice. So this should be enough to demonstrate that there's a lot of different ways to sort. How do we determine which sorting method is best? Uh, worst case. So one possibility is worst case scenario. What's another possibility? Average case. Average case. Which do you prefer? Worst case. 
<laughs> well, well. <coughs> I was like, it's cryptographically secure hackers. So a, a lot of it depends on <laughs> how bad is the worst case. So, and how frequently does the worst case occur? If the worst case or things close to the worst case <coughs> occur often, that's very different than they're, if they're extremely rare. And so I might be willing to go with something that has a slightly worse um, worst case if it has a much better average case. Or conversely, if the worst case could occur frequently, I might not want to go with something that has the best average case. So a lot of it depends on what you're going to do. Have you seen switching algorithms as an approach? So sometimes what you do is you have two algorithms. You have one that has a pretty good average, but is occasionally really bad. And you have another one that's okay for everything. And you run the thing that's pretty fast for a while, and if it's having trouble with your input, then you stop and you switch to the other one. And so by switching back and forth between two algorithms, you can often do a lot better. So in fact, some of the best ways to sort might actually even be a mixture of these, that try one of the methods, and if it's taking too long, stop, switch to something else. All right. So the whole point of this is that when we're trying to do a problem, it's not always clear what is the metric. I'll give uh, one other example of the importance of a metric. How many of you have done linear regression or the method of least squares, finding the best fit line? Right, so almost everyone. So if you have a bunch of data points, you, know, you frequently want to find the best fit line through the data. This is extremely important in statistics. There's a couple of different ways you can measure error. So let's say you predict y equals ax plus b. So the first choice of error is the <coughs> sum over i of yi minus axi plus b. What's bad about this method? Yes? A negative and positive errors. Yeah, negative errors and positive errors could clear some. So if I have two points here, is it clear to everybody what's the best fit line between these two points? Yes, it's the line exactly like this. Because that error cancels with that error. Right? If we use signed errors, this is absurd. All right, so clearly this is out. Let's try E2. So I just erased, I turn the brackets into absolute values. That's a pretty good method. What's the problem with using absolute values? Yes? There could be multiple best options. There will, well, there probably will not be multiple best non, options. Uh, non convex? Or? It's non, but it's not, convex is not the word I want. Non Non-differentiable. Non -differentiable. The tools of calculus are not applicable because the absolute value function is not differentiable. So we frequently use E3. I'll turn these down into parentheses. And we put a square. Now, the problem with E3 is large errors get magnified. So if you have one data point that's a bit off, it's going to really pull up the line. So I like to say, if I'm hired as a consultant, I use the sum of squares. And if I'm hiring someone, I ask them to use absolute values. The absolute values is much harder to use. You actually have a closed form solution for what the best values of A and B are when you use sums of squares. You do not have that when you use absolute values. You have to do numerical simulations. And it's much, much harder to find. It's nice when you have closed form expressions for your parameters. So it's a real issue <coughs> in terms of what is your metric for success. To some extent, if you have the freedom to choose your metric, you can make it more likely that you will be successful. Right? Look at how well we did. And you chose a late measure success. All right, so let's return to the egg drop problem. Uh, I'm sorry to hear about your voice again. So <laughs> we're dropping, we have two eggs, and these are magic eggs. There is some critical floor below which they will not crack and no damage will happen, above which they will crack immediately. And we want to find out what's the highest floor we can drop them at. Does anybody <coughs> have any strategy suggestions or any ideas of what we should do first? 
Yes. Is the first one to go up some set of steps, like some k steps? Okay, so we, we could take the first one <coughs> and we go up some k steps, and if it cracks... And then if it cracks, then for everything under that, you do it sequentially. Good. So then you go up another k steps, and then you... Okay, do the same so thing. one approach is drop k if dot crack drop k more if not, and then just keep repeating. And then once it cracks, you're out of luck. And you only have one egg left. Oh, you go down to the previous, or the one right above the previous one. Right. So what should we really do before we do this problem? What should, we, what should our first stop be before we do the two-egg problem? Yeah, and we've seen this a couple of times that frequently you have a problem posed to you and you should really do the earlier case to build up intuition. Now, the one egg problem is pretty straightforward. <coughs> What's the only thing you can do with the one egg problem? You have to drop it every floor starting at the first. If you dropped it anywhere else, if you dropped it at the floor two and it cracks, you don't know if it's floor one or floor two. So fortunately, the one egg problem is extremely straightforward. Once you're down to one egg, you have nothing to do but one step at a time. Okay, so what's nice is you've given me not only a method, but a method with a parameter. So we get to choose what k is. Excellent. Any thoughts on a good choice for k? <coughs> or any thoughts on no choice for k? It doesn't have to be a good choice. There's only one choice I will accept as truly bad and annoying. What's the one bad choice for K? One. <laughs> one. <laughs> right? Two is secure, so you probably want to. Okay, so one possibility is two plus two. Right. Right now we're not seeing how good they are, but just what else could we do? Can we get different K values? Yeah. Three. Can we try K three? <laughs> three? What else? Four. Four. All right, let's go up a little higher. Ten. Ten. <coughs> Twenty. Twenty. So which would you like to analyze first, the 2 or the 50? 2. two. So if we drop it at 2, we're going to do worst case scenario. So it's very important to remind us that we are working on worst case scenario. So if you want, whatever strategy you are using, <coughs> you have an evil architect who will design the building to, and will design the eggs so that they will crack in the most drops required, okay? If you assume that the floor in which the egg cracks is uniformly distributed among the 100 numbers, then this is not necessarily the best way to go because then the average might be much better than the worst case. The worst case is also easier to analyze because then you look at your method and say, what's the worst case? Versus, oh my God, if it's the average case, I have to analyze how many drops it is for every possibility. So sometimes we choose a statistic based on which is going to be easier for us to analyze. Worst case is also a pretty good one. Um, I was in a hotel today, uh, not today, I guess, yesterday, <coughs> and as I was leaving my room, I did go into an object that had a warning. Anybody know what object this was? There was a certain number and we were not supposed to exceed it. Elevator, right? When you're in elevators, mm -hmm. they have you know, only so many people. Well, really, it doesn't matter how many people. It matters the weight. What's the danger of having too many people? <laughs> the elevator goes down faster than, it's, than you want, and you die. Yes? Do you know that at least one floor is safe? We do not. Oh. So it is possible that it could break on the first floor. Because mm -hmm. if you knew the first floor was safe, then you would just chop off the first floor of the building and relabel. So for a lot of things, there is so much damage or danger of failing that you often be a little bit uh, conservative. And so you really care about the worst case. You don't really care about the average load in the elevator. Wait, but could it be that there's a floor, like there's no... Uh... It's possible that it, it, it is safe from every floor. Oh, okay. So that if it's possible that if you drop it from 100, it doesn't crack. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
And so when you're building a lot of things, you often care about the worst case. You don't care about the average load on a bridge or an elevator. You care about the worst <coughs> case load. So over here, if we dropped it at two, what's the worst case for us? Like how many drops? How many drops? Um, 50. 50. So I think if you drop it at two, four, eight, drop it at 98, it still hasn't cracked. And then you can drop it at 100, and it cracks, and then you have to drop it at 99. Or you drop it at 99, it doesn't crack, you have to drop it at 100. So actually, how many drops is it at two? It's 51. Let's look at 50. If you drop it at 50, if it doesn't crack, this is wonderful. Right? But if it cracks, then you have to do 49 more drops, potentially. Okay, so it looks like in this one, that would be 50. So if you have to do like 98 drops or 99? Well, let's say it cracks at 50. Yeah. Then you have to go one at a time, so that would be 49. Oh, because, yeah. Right. Now, if it doesn't crack at 50, then I know it's from 51 to 100. Let's drop it at 75. And if it cracks or doesn't crack there, I've now eliminated enough flows that even if I go one at a time, it'll be a shorter number of drops than this. So the worst case for us would be is if it cracks at 50. Notice how similar these two answers are. They're very <coughs> comparable. And philosophically, they're the two different extremes. So how would you summarize what this is doing? How would you summarize what this is doing? What's so good about this? What's so good about this? Three more phases, two phase. Like if you sort of get to the like the worst case, you don't have to do that much kind of like work to recover. Okay, no, not so if you get to the worst case. The once the egg cracks, <coughs> once the egg cracks, then you only have to do <coughs> one more drop. Yeah. So that's really good. Only one more drop when you crack. What's really good about this case potentially? What would be two drops? Or maybe this is really sensitive. Well, but, <coughs> but if you drop at 100 and it cracks, then you would have to go floor by floor. So you could do 50, then you could do 75. And then if you're lucky, you might get away with like logarithmic hmm. in terms of the number of drops. It's yeah, it's, it's less drops. It's less yeah. drops if you're lucky. But So over here, the second drop was really good. We only had to use one more drop you know, for the second egg. Over here, what's really good potentially about the first drop? It may not happen, but what might be what might what might we be lucky enough to get on that first drop? We might just notice like volume shifted. Yeah, we might be able to eliminate the lot. You know, possibility to eliminate large number of floors on a drop. So again, I, I do not think any of you are ever going to be dropping eggs from buildings professionally, or probably <coughs> even as amateurs. But this idea of how you analyze this problem, it's extremely valuable. We have two very competing influences. This is really good because once that first egg cracks, we have very small local work to do. But it could take us a long time to find where to zoom in on. Over here, we try to cover large amounts of area very rapidly. <coughs> and if we're lucky and it doesn't crack, then we're in great shape. But if it cracks, we could be in trouble. Now, if we were looking at an average case, this might actually now start to be much better than this. OK. So of these numbers, which do you think you might want to check now between 3, 4, 10, and 20? Which do you think might be really good? 10. 10. Why 10? So, <coughs> ah, okay, so equalizers. So how would you equalize 2 and 50? What's their average? Well, it's a two next to 
the geometric mean is 10, right? We talked about arithmetic means and geometric means. The geometric mean of 2 and 50, when well, they multiply to 100, so their square root is 10. That's right in the middle. So let's say we do it for 10. The worst case from us is we drop it nine times and then have to do 10 more drops after that. So that would only be on the order of 19. <coughs> That's significantly better. Let's take a look at three. So what would we have for worst case for three? Yeah, then we more. So I think about 34 times. Because if we drop it 33 times, we get up to 99. And then we have to check 400. Yeah, yeah. 400. 90, 35, yeah. I'm sorry. What if it's, um, like, uh, it's 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, I was saying, if we do 33 drops, doesn't that get us to 499? Yeah. But then but then that, that oh, but if it breaks there, yeah. right, right. So yes. Yes, yeah, so we have to do two more. So it's 35, yes. Great. All right, so what if we do four? So it would be 24 drops to get up to 96. And then maybe even another three more, worst case. Or is it, so let's say it doesn't break at 96. Then do we just do three more drops or? See, this is where it gets annoying because you could be off by about one depending on how you do it. You know, because if it doesn't break at 96, do we now <coughs> drop it at 100? And, then you have and then if it cracks, then we have to do three more. So I'll put these a little bit in quotes. You know, they, they're, they're accurate within one. So 25, is, <coughs> so at most 28, maybe 27, something like that. But enough so that you know it's significantly more. Mm -hmm. Let's say we do the 20s. You know, if we do four drops that gets us to 80, and if it cracks then, we would have to do 19 more. So no matter what, it's going to be at least 23. <coughs> okay. Any questions on the two egg problem? There are a lot of ways to generalize. Give me two ways to generalize. There's n squared floors too. So how many floors? N squared. Not necessarily n squared, although n squared might be nice. How many floors? Did you say n floors? N, n floors. Of n. So one possibility is <coughs> imagine now we have n floors. That's one generalization. What's the other generalization? And eggs, yeah. So you can increase the number of eggs. So how far have you seen for generalizations? Uh, n floors. Okay. <coughs> have you seen more? Have you seen more eggs? No. Okay. Is this the best solution you've seen, or have you seen a better solution than this? For a hundred floor? Yeah. Uh, I think this is the best one I've seen. Okay, you regained your voice. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the best solution for a hundred. So we'll still do 100 for a little bit, because we're not at the best. By what metric? <laughs> By the worst case scenario. Okay. Yes. There is a better solution than this. It's close to the best. Oh, we would want to make one move and then treat oh. it as when you have equals 90, right? Yeah. So when you have the second egg, mm -hmm. uh, you can... I was going to say go up by two, but I'm not, I don't think that works. So you were close when you said, if it doesn't break, now we have two eggs and 90. So where would you drop with two eggs and 90? Square root of 90. Square root of 10. Well, well, the square root of 90 is less than 10. Well, but then that means it could take actually a little bit longer. So unfortunately, what you did is you made the problem worse. <laughs> but <laughs> if you tweak your, what you said by a small amount, you then have the best answer. So you said, let's drop it at 10, and then let's play the game with a 90-story with a building. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to play the game with a 90-story building. Where should you drop the first egg? Not at 10. 
Do you want to drop it higher than 10 or lower than 10? Higher. Higher. So the whole point is the larger number you have, as soon as it fails, then you are stuck going floor by floor by floor by floor. Thus, you don't want your number to be too big because once it cracks, you are stuck going floor by floor by floor. So this forces you towards the two. But on the other side, the larger your drop is, the more things you can potentially eliminate. And that pushes you towards the 50. So if we drop the first one at more than 10, if it cracks, fine, we go floor by floor by floor. But then we haven't done all these 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. So we have a huge number of drops by 10. So what we can do is we can afford to drop it a little bit further up. And then we'll have a smaller building. All right, so let's see how much better we can do now. So, any thought, gut instincts? Yeah. If between, since we know we can do 10 and 19, right. it has to be lower than 19, or else we have a guaranteed worst case. Good. Scenario. Excellent. So it's 10 plus <coughs> equal to best plus equal to 19. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so, the reason I love this problem is there are so <coughs> many good concepts. We're trying to balance out two things, right? What if we made every case equally bad? So the first case is drop in break. So let's say we drop it at the B4. How many steps will that be if it drops? It'll just be B. Yeah. Now, for the next one, so didn't break. Let's call this B1. So drop at B2. And now let's say it breaks. So how many steps will it take now? No. No. B2 plus 1. So first, we had one drop, and it didn't break from this. Then we drop another one, and it breaks at B1 plus B2. So then we have to check all the numbers from B1 plus 1 to B2 minus 1. So that's the number of drops. Right? That was from dropping the first egg, it didn't break. That was dropping the first egg again, and it broke at floor B1 plus B2. And now we have to do B2 minus 1 drops. So this is 1 plus B2. So if we want to equalize these, what should B2 equal? Sorry. <coughs> yes? Wait, can you explain why again? The, so you drop sure. one We drop B1. it at B1, and it's OK. Yeah. We drop it at B1 plus B2, and it breaks. Oh, we drop it at B1 plus B2. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> oh, we drop it at oh, sorry. B2. At, so I'll be right. Drop at B1 plus okay. B2. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm sorry. So, the, so then that would explain your B2 minus B1. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we drop it B2 <coughs> further. So what do we need for B2 to equal? B1 minus 1. So B2 is B1 minus 1 to equalize. And now for the next one, didn't break at B1, B1 plus B2, breaks at B1 plus B2 plus B3. And this yields B3 is B1 minus 2. Minus two. I really hope the pattern is clear. Right? So what would the next one be? B1 minus 2. B1 minus 2. So now we just keep going, and every drop 
if it doesn't break, is one less than the previous. So let's try to figure out what that would be. All right, so we want b1 plus b1 minus 1 plus b1 minus 2 plus 1 to equal our number n. Right? If we have n floors. What is this sum equal? <coughs> the sum of So it actually tells us the best floors are going to be the triangular floors. Mm -hmm. So we basically get b1 plus a half is approximately equal to the square root of 2n. Because b1 times b1 plus 1 is approximately b1 plus a half squared. So we get b1 is approximately 1 half plus the square root of 2n. And so if I take n equals 100, I would get about 14. So we get b1 is about 14 or 15 <coughs> if n equals 100. And because they're all equalized, then this will tell us it now takes 14 drops. Oh, I'm sorry, this should be a minus a half. So the square root of 2 is about 1.414. So when I multiply by um, 10, I would get 14.1. So this should probably be like 13 or 14. So something like 13 or 14 drops. So all of the analysis today is accurate to within one. Uh, o of one means an oh, arbitrary binary, constant. Right. right. So this is actually better than O of one. This is one. Uh, I will risk another pop culture reference. Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Have people please seen this? Why did the Germans mess up? Why did they dig in the wrong spot? Blast from the past. <laughs> they like read the map wrong or something, right? The medallion was burned onto the German's ah. hand, but they only had the front. And they didn't know that the uh, back said, but subtract one for the Hebrew God who is one. <laughs> and so they had their staff was off by one unit. And so they were pointed to the wrong spot on the map. So off by one, but you know, made all the difference in the Third Reich. All right? Over here, all of my analysis will be accurate to within one. So when you have something like this, you should probably check both 13 and 14 and see which is best. But it tells you that the floors that are going to work the best are going to be the triangular numbers. So what would be a good triangle number to use around 100? What's the closest triangle number? So it's 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 36. Yes? And the next is 57. Oh, wait, no, this is, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I switched it to like Fibonacci pattern. It still works. All right, so over here, I need to add 7. Yeah. yeah. And I get 36. 28. Oh, 36 does end up. Yeah. Oh. So now I add 8. I do get 36. Interesting. All right. 45, 55. All right, so then 55, then 66. Oh, that's good. All right. And then I add uh, 12. So it would be 78. I add 13. So it would be 70, 80, 91. And then add 14 to be 105. I thought you were just skipping 28 and 25. No. <laughs> That's the first thing. 
I, I somehow moved into Fibonacci mode. <laughs> so 105 <coughs> is pretty close to 100. So my gut feeling is probably the best we can do is probably 14. I think 14 would be better than 13. Because 105 is, I think, much closer than 91. But it would be interesting if we had like 92, 93 floors, probably 13 would be better. So this is a great problem. It's a little bit surprising at times what you can do. You can come up with a really good strategy, and then you can tweak it a little bit. Now the question is, how much of an improvement are you getting? So you want to get into a little bit of an error analysis. So let's compare the two different strategies and then we'll generalize. So in the initial strategy, we had you know, drop every square root of it, right? And the cost is basically twice square root of it. I'm not going to worry about the plus or minus one at the end, right? Because the worst case is I have to drop it root n every single time. In this case, the cost is basically square root of 2n. Mu cost is basically square root of 2n. So you save a factor of square root of 2. So depending on how you look at it, that's about a 40% savings. That's great, but it's not saving with respect to n. So as n gets very, very large, yes, I, I would love a 40% savings, but I would love even more to decrease the exponent of n, which we can't do. So what I want to do is I want to go back a little bit and talk about how you could see that screw root of n is, is approximately the way you should be going. So let's say we drop every k. So worst case, how many steps could that be? And this is the part I'm looking forward to doing with college students as opposed to high school kids. Right, but more generally not 100 over k. Oh, n over k. N over k. Plus k. Yeah. Minus no, no, you don't. You're not, we're not worrying about <laughs> adding or subtracting. We're not worrying about that at all. How would you minimize this? Yeah, endpoints, take the derivative. Now, it's clear the endpoints are not going to be the minimum. And if you take the derivative with respect to k, you're going to get a negative n <coughs> over k squared plus 1 equals 0, therefore k equals the square root of n. Another thing you could do, it's not as good, but another thing you could do is set n over k equal to k, and it also yields k equal to the square root of n. And what I'm basically saying is, I want the two steps to take the same amount of time. It turns out for this particular version, that's fine. In general, is that what you would want to do? No, I want to minimize the sum. I don't want to have each one of them equally bad. This is, uh, I think the best way to describe it is how some people do not understand Amazon. If you have a product that you want that's one cent and then say $2 for shipping, a lot of people get upset that they have to spend you know, such a huge percent more than the product is worth on shipping. How much does the item cost? The item is one cent, it's two dollars for shipping. How much are you paying? Two dollars and one cent. So you just need to ask yourself, is two dollars and one cent a good price for the product? Does it matter that two dollars is going to shipping and one cent is going to the product? You know, are you happy to get the item for two dollars and one cent? And if the answer is yes, then you buy it. I will admit once in my life I could not do this. I was actually at the math camp where I have lectured on this problem. And we went to like an Aubon pan, and I was getting a bagel with cream cheese. And the cream cheese was more expensive than the bagel. <laughs> and, you know, the total price was a little bit high, but the fact that the cream cheese cost more than the bagel, just to me, that was too excessive. And I could not look at the total amount I'm paying for the bagel. <laughs> I just could not go through with it. 
But in general, if you just equalize these various things, this is often not a bad way to get to a rough, close approximation to the solution. And frequently, when you're trying to do problem solving, you want to just get a rough feel. We've got 10 minutes left. You know, this is almost surely a well thought out, planned lecture, right? So it's already been mentioned. What do we look at now? More eggs. More eggs. And so the question is, what do you think the power of n will be as we <coughs> get more eggs? Do you think we'll ever do worse? Why can't we do worse? Yes, we could just use two of them. Right. If we have three eggs, we could just keep one egg on the side because we like to look at it. Right? You can't do worse. Hopefully you can do better. So the question is, we now know what's the best thing to do with two eggs. Now, the best thing is actually to do the triangle number approach. Let's not do the triangle number approach because that's a little bit harder. <coughs> Let's just do the other case where we will drop it at square root. All right, so we now have three eggs. Where do we drop the first? We should denote it by and then you're gonna go to B2. I wanna try I wanna try to mimic what we did before. You know, so we drop it at K. So worst case, how many drops of high K would you have before you get your first break? So worst case scenario, how many drops might you have? N over K. N over K. And now when it breaks, how many steps? Break case four, then this is. Yes. And so what number goes in here? How many floors do we have now for the building? K. It would be square. It would be two square root of K, or n over K plus square root of two K. This is if we do the better approach. And almost surely, dropping every k is not the best. We should probably maybe do a triangle approach here as well. So I'll ignore doing this case. Let's just do this one. So the simple is we want n over k is equal to two square roots of k. So that means n halves is equal to k to the 3 halves. So k is equal to n halves to the 2 thirds. This is the non-calculus approach. Just let me equalize the two of them. This may not be the best result, but at least it will be a result. And now the cost is n over k plus 2 square roots of k. Well, what does n over k equal? Oh, wait. Yeah, they both they both equal the same thing. So uh, this is just going to be twice n over k because we've equalized them, and so we will just get four square roots of k, right? So we get four square roots of k. So that'll be n halves to the one third. Okay, so I'll say, so the first one gives us 4 over the cube root of 2 times n to the 1 third. The important thing is to see how the power of n decreases. What would you conjecture now for 4x? Yeah, probably 4th root. And keep going like that. All right, but this is a college <coughs> class. This is not high school kids or elementary school kids. We know calculus. So I can erase all this, and let's see how much better we do with calculus. Right, again, the endpoints will not matter. But f prime is going to be negative n over k squared. And now it will be a little bit more interesting here, right? Now we take the 2 and the 1 half will cancel. This will be plus k to the minus a half equals 0. So we get k to the 3 halves equals n. 
which is a little bit different than what we had before. And so now we get as the cost, it'll be two, it'll be uh, two times each of these terms, so two times the square root of k, so it'll be four times the square root of k, uh, so this is the same as k is n to the two thirds, so it'll be four n to the one third. This is not looking good. It should not be. <laughs> oh, that's right, that's right. The cost is no, is no longer double because the two terms are no longer equal. Thank you. Good. So n over k, uh, we have k is equal to n to the two thirds. So n over k, good. So <coughs> will be n to the one third. And then two square roots of k will be plus two n to the one third, good. And then it'll be three and to the one third, excellent. And three is less than four divided by the cube root of two. So it takes more and more work to get good constants here. And if you want to, for a problem, you could try to figure out, well, what's the best constant you could get? Can I maybe do triangle method with triangle method? And not just naively move up the same amount every single time. Can I show that if I have e eggs, I always get e n to the 1 over e, where of course e is not e. But it seems clear that you should be able to prove by induction without too much trouble that there is some constant. So if you have um, d eggs, you would have cd n to the 1 over d. It seems like you should be able to get that without too much trouble by induction. You know, these constants may not be great, but you should be able to get them without too much trouble. Even just equalizing things and bypassing calculus should be enough. And what you're able to do is you're able to sniff out a good amount. So my question for you, the final question of the class, do you think this is the best method? Basically, let's say go back, in, back with two eggs. For two eggs, it might be the best method. You know, for three and higher, you, we need to do some work to prove that you can't come up with a completely different strategy. You know, when you have more and more eggs at your disposal, maybe you can afford to take some risks. But remember, it's always the worst case scenario, not the... But problems like this often have levels of solution. One of the things people don't understand when they try to apply math outside of the college classroom, you don't have to get the best answer. You just have to do better than the other people around you. And that is a much lower bar. <laughs> right? There's frequently a lot of opportunity, even with the amount of math you've already had, to make valuable contributions as consultants, as summer interns, because what people are doing is so far from optimal <laughs> that even if you don't reach optimal, you're going to be much better than they already are. The closer you get to optimal, the harder it is to go that last little extra bit. <coughs> right, so this is a good place to stop.